We have been talking for the last couple of weeks about idols of our hearts and how these idols we have in our hearts affect us. And I, I thought that I was going to finish it two weeks ago when, when I last preached and I talked about the cure for the idols of the hearts, but I've had a lot of feedback from folks in the last couple of weeks and thank you for that. And there was just one more thing I felt like we needed to do for today to kind of draw this to a close as we're talking about idols of the hearts. And that is to talk about what it is that motivates you. Because it's tied. All these things are tied to our heart. And the thing I want to drive in today that I hope you'll take away from our time together is just this, that I want you to live a commandment-driven life motivated by love and not a feeling-driven life. One that's driven by your feelings and your own thoughts. As a reminder, we read in Ezekiel, our idols blind us and they bind us. And they must be dealt with. We have to deal with the idols of our lives. These idols of the heart that stand between us and God because they really are keeping us from doing what we ought to do. The first part last week, I would say, then, was this idea of preparing for war. We have a battle of the mind. And if you remember, we talked very briefly about the fact that we said we have to um, transform our way of thinking. Not being conformed to the patterns of this world, but being transformed by the renewing of our mind. We have to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That's kind of like step one in this idea of dealing with the idols of our lives and how they bind us and they keep us from being who we ought to be in our relationship with God. And secondly, today I want to talk about how to live a commandment-driven life. That is, making right decisions and making right choices. Choices that we make, but are often driven by our feelings, rather than the commands and the Word of God. So we're going to look at two stories in 1 Sam. If you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn over there now. We're going to look at two stories in 1 Samuel about a king who was rejected, that is, King Saul. And I want you to see in each of these stories, there is a commandment that is given. There's a choice that's made. Then there's a consequence that follows. So in the two stories, and we're going to read them in their entirety. And then we're going to look at these three things. A commandment that was given, a choice that was made, and the consequence that followed. And I want us to see how we can apply this to our own lives so that we would make sure, certain that as often as possible we're walking in the ways of God and in our own ways. Remember, months ago I talked about there's two wisdoms that we can follow. There's the wisdom of God and the wisdom of man. One is characterized by God's word and the other one's characterized by our own wisdom our own folly and we always I hope want to follow in the wisdom of God not in our own wisdom because our own wisdom leads to folly and following God's wisdom and his word leads to life Jesus remember Jesus said I have come to have my have life and have it how abundantly an abundant life and that and we're going to see we're going to talk about this even too Jesus is the perfect example of what it looks like to follow a commandment-driven life motivated by love. So let's read 1 Samuel chapter 13, verses 8 through 18. I hope you have your Bibles. We don't have it on the screen because it is a lot to read, and I didn't want to give them like 48 slides this morning. (laughs) All right. So here we have it. If you have your own Bibles, I hope you'll look it up. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 13. I'm going to go back really quickly to to chapter 10, verse 8. I want to read one thing to you, and then we're going to go over to chapter 13. This is Samuel speaking to Saul in chapter 10, verse 8. He says, Then go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I am coming to you to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice peace offerings. Seven days you shall wait until I come to you and show you what you shall do. And now picking up in chapter 13, verse 8. He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal, and the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, bring the burnt offering here to me and the peace offering. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. 
And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, what have you done? And Saul said, when I saw that the people were scattering from me, that you did not come within the days appointed and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, now the Philistines will come down against me out Gilgal and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. Do you think he was walking in his own flesh there? You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And Samuel rose and went up from Gilgal. The rest of the people went up after Saul to meet the army. They went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. So we see here that there was a commandment given to Saul by Samuel. He said, go to Gilgal and wait there seven days and then I will come, Samuel said, I will come and we will offer the sacrifice and then I'll tell you what you shall do. Now at the end of these seven days, Saul realized that the men were leaving him. So the command was given, wait here for seven days. And at the end of the seven days, when Samuel doesn't show up, Saul starts to get worried and the people are leaving him. And then he makes a choice right there. <laughs> he, he says, when Samuel came to him, he said, well, I had to force myself to do this. I had to force myself. With every choice that presents itself, you need to ask. Will I serve God in obedience or will I serve myself? Saul here chose to serve himself rather than to follow the command that God was giving him. What was his motivator? Fear. At this point, it was fear. He was fearful of losing his army. He was fearful of losing the people who were with him because they knew they were about to be attacked by the Philistines. And he didn't want to lose his army. He didn't want to be attacked. So his fear prompted him to act in disobedience to God. And then there was a consequence that followed. Samuel said to Saul, you have done what? Foolishly. You've done foolishly. You've not kept the command of the Lord. He said, if you had kept the command of the Lord, the Lord would have established your kingdom in Israel forever. There would have been a positive thing from having followed the command. But now there was a negative consequence for disobedience here. Now your kingdom shall not continue. See, with every command that God gives to us, there are consequences that can follow. There can be a positive consequence. There can be a negative consequence. And in this particular case, it was a negative one. He did not do as God had commanded him. Now I want you to turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 15. We're going to look, we're going to read a longer section here. And again, I want you to look for this as we're reading. The commandment that's given, the choice that's made, and then the consequence that follows after that. And Samuel said to Saul, the Lord sent me to anoint you king over his people Israel. Now therefore listen to the words of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I have noted what Amalek did to Israel in opposing them on the way when they came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and devote to destruction all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So here we have the commandment that's given. So Saul summoned the people and numbered them in Tulane, 200,000 men on foot, and 10,000 men of Judah. And Saul came to the city of Amalek and lay in wait in the valley. Then Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the people of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. And Saul defeated the Amalekites from Havilah as far as Shur, which is east of Egypt. And he took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive 
and devoted to destruction all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fattened calves and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them. All that was despised and worthless, they devoted to destruction. The word of the Lord came to Samuel, I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not followed, performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry and he cried to the Lord all night. And Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning. And it was told Samuel, Saul came to Carmel and behold, he set up a monument for himself and turned and passed on and went down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul and Saul said to him, Blessed be you to the Lord, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God, and the rest we have devoted to destruction. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stop, I will tell you what the Lord said to me this night. And he said to him, speak. And Samuel said, though you are little in your own eyes, are you not the head of the tribes of Israel? The Lord anointed you king over Israel. And the Lord sent you on a mission and said, go devote to destruction the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you pounce on the spoil and do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? And Saul said to Samuel, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. I have gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and I have devoted the the Amalekites to destruction. But the people took the spoil, sheep and oxen, the best of the things devoted to destruction, to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of divination, and presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he has also rejected you from being king. And Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you've rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. And Samuel turned to go away. Saul seized the skirt of his robe, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours, who is better than you? So again, we see in this story that there is a commandment that is given. God anoints Saul to be king over Israel, and he says, now I want you to go against the Amalekites, those sinners, and I want you to utterly destroy them. This is God's judgment upon these people for sin. I want you to destroy them utterly, all of them, including the sheep and the cattle and the goats and everything else. So the commandment is given, and it is very clear. When y'all read this, when I just read this, was it clear to you what the command was? Yeah, I hope so. It was clear. And I, and I hope it was clear for, for Saul too. But Saul had a choice to make. And when it came time to do what God had commanded him to do, he didn't follow through with the command. With every choice that presents itself, we have to ask the question, will I serve God in obedience or will I serve myself? Now, in this story, they destroyed everything that was despised and worthless. But who was it that made a determination about what was despised and worthless? The people did. They're the ones who made that decision. We'll look at it and we'll determine what's good and what's bad. And if it's bad, then that's what we'll get rid of. And we'll keep the rest of it. 
They kept for themselves the spoils. Saul here is acting in pride. God had said, and then Saul did otherwise. He put himself before God. As a matter of fact, he practiced selective obedience. He practiced a form of obedience that was not full obedience to God. And then to to cap it all off, he set up a monument for himself in Carmel to his own greatness. Now, when he's confronted, he does not own up to his own sin, does he? Samuel comes and confronts him. He comes out like, I've performed the commandments of the Lord. I've done it just like God commanded me to do. He is calling partial obedience full obedience. But Samuel sets him straight. And then he claims that he did what he did in order to honor God. We, we kept the good stuff so that we could sacrifice it to God to honor him. And Samuel's response here, I think, is very interesting because he did say to him, did God anoint you to be king? Didn't he set you up to be the king? He's like, well, I was afraid of the people. And, and so they, they wanted to keep the stuff. So rather than it being God's authority given to Saul as king to pass down to the people, Saul allowed the people to speak into his life, and he was telling God then what he had done was right. And don't we sometimes do this too? We listen to others. We allow them to stir us up. We let them come and talk to us, and that motivates our feelings so that we might do things that would be evil in the sight of God. God has put a system of authority in place. And in this story, we read about that authority. God has anointed Saul to be king over Israel. And Saul did not take on the role that God had given to him. And even doubles down in verse 20, says, I have obeyed, I have obeyed, and we have a sacrifice to give. And look here at what Samuel's response to him is. To obey is better than what? Sacrifice. To obey God is better to sacrifice. Obedience is better than sacrifice because it involves sacrificing ourselves and what we think is best to him. It's not about what I want. I'm going to follow what God wants. Because God is king. We should never think that we can compensate for our lack of obedience to some of God's will by making other sacrifices for him. When God says do this, it's very clear he wants us to do what? That. Not some other thing and then say it was some of that. Here's my will and my desire for you. Saul was ruled by his emotions, by his feelings. And it's not the first time or the last time we're going to see that with Saul if you read through Scripture. His feelings often get him in trouble. He rebelled. Verse number 23, uh, when Samuel was speaking to him, he said he's rebelled. And here's what he says to him. Rebellion is as the sin of divination. He rebelled. And also says he presumed. Presumption is as iniquity and idolatry. That's interesting. Presumption. He presumed something. He presumed something. And Samuel here's quoting scripture says that is akin to idolatry. He's making an idol in his own life. He's setting himself up as God by making decisions when God has told him otherwise Departure from God's will is rebellion. It presumes to control the future course of events, just as divination does. A failure to carry out God's will, which is insubordination, is wicked, which is iniquity, and puts the insubordinate person in God's place. That's why this is a form of idolatry. And notice here, again, there's a consequence that's going to follow. In verse number 23, he says, because you have a rejected the word of God, he also is rejecting you from being king. 
the consequence follows. Every act of disobedience is a rejection of the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord. Thus says the Lord. In verse 28, he says, The Lord has torn the kingdom from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And this becomes the crucial distinction between Saul as king and the one who would come after him to be king, King David. God was interested in having a king who was after God's own heart. He wants our hearts. And on this particular time, he's rejected him as being king over Israel. The Lord has torn the king of Israel from you this day. He's given to a neighbor of yours who's better than you. This one who is after the heart of God. Every choice that presents itself, we have to ask the question, will I serve God in obedience or will I serve myself? 2 Corinthians 5.5 5 says, So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him, to please God. Now last week we talked about these idols of the heart and curing idols of the heart by preparing for war. Actually, it was two weeks ago, not last week. We have to take every thought captive in our hearts and our minds. We have to work on our thought life because our thought life gets in the way. This week, I want you to see that we need to live a commandment-driven life motivated by love rather than a feeling-driven life that's motivated to serve. And his kingdom was rejected. I want us to recognize the need to live a commandment-driven life. One devoted to the word of God and what he commands and tells us. So that we can see how we can have the abundant life. And this applies to us honestly, both individually as people and corporately as a church. We must do everything that we do in order to please him as it pertains to God's word. As a church and as a people, we follow his word and his commands. Amen? That's who we're called to be. We are not our own. We belong to him. We sung the songs this morning. Do you not know that you were bought with a price? You do not belong to yourselves. You belong to God through Jesus Christ. You belong to him. As part of the body of Christ, God makes the decisions for his church, not the people. That would be like us telling Saul to tell God what we're going to do. And it's never supposed to operate and work that way. It's God who directs his people and his people who follow through on his word. Now, I've given to you guys, I don't know if everyone got one today, but I, I gave a handout that I think got passed around, and it looks like this. And I want you to take a look at the diagram on the handout, if you got one. If you didn't get one, or if you did get one and someone beside you didn't have one, pass it over. They were, <coughs> I believe some of them handed out inside the bulletins. I want you to see here that on the bottom, there's a big heart. And on this heart, there's the word... Uh, there's Matthew 15, 19 that's written there. We've talked about this already. Matthew 15, 19 says, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander, things like these. It's from the hearts that the evil flows from. It's not someone else that made us do it. We do it. We have to own up to this. I do what I do because I want what I want. I do what I do because I want what I want. This is the life motivating, self-motivating activity that happens to us. It's happening in the inner man. So our thinking is there. And then up to our thinking, we get to the choice, the point of decision that has to be made. And we saw in these stories that Saul had a choice to be made. A commandment was given to him, and it came to this point of decision. What would he do? To the right of the circle is a feeling-motivated or feeling-oriented life. 
this is how we most often make decisions in our lives. And, and I, I just want to say, we all do it. I do it too. I allow my feelings to impact my decision-making process. And so many times when we do what we feel compelled to do, we end up acting foolishly, just like Saul did. You have done foolishly, Samuel said to him. This is us acting in our own wisdom, walking in our own wisdom, wisdom that ends up in folly. Saul did this twice in the stories we read. His decisions were tied to his feelings, and he acted foolishly. Now, feelings aren't bad. I want to say that. Feelings aren't bad. God gave them to us. That's why we have them, because God gave them to us. But we shouldn't live by them or let them rule us, because that's not biblical. That's not biblical. Feelings are based on you. Now, it also says here that there's the, uh, below the arrow, it says it's easy now. When we make choices based on our feelings, it's very easy to make those choices. We do them, comes to us very quickly, but over time, it gets harder and harder to make good, wise choices based on our feelings because we keep on doing more and more things that are bad and filled with folly. You can make countless easy decisions based on your feelings, but they will lead to more difficult times in your life. And I think experience tells a lot of us that that is true. Would you agree? I know it's true for me. The feeling-oriented life leads to sin and self. It leads to idols of the heart that control our lives. It's completely motivated by the self. And if you're reading Galatians chapter 5, that is the flesh. But here's what we know. Scripture tells us, you reap what you sow. Galatians 6, 7 says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. What we want to do is we want to reap the flesh. I mean, I'm sorry, we want to sow the flesh and reap the spirit, but that never happens. You cannot sow your flesh and then reap the spirit. If you sow the spirit, I mean, sow the flesh, you're going to reap the flesh. The Bible is very clear of this. Proverbs 13, 15 says, good judgment wins favor, but the way of the unfaithful leads to their destruction. When you're following your own way, it leads on a path of destruction. The rule of the harvest is this, the rule of the harvest. You will reap later than you sow, you'll reap more than you sow, and it will always cost you more than you wanted to pay, especially in terms of sin and self. You're going to reap more than you sow, and it's going to cost you more than you wanted to pay in the process. Hosea 8, 7 says, they sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. And later on in Hosea 10, 13, it says, you have plowed iniquity, you have reaped injustice, you've eaten the fruit of lies, because you have trusted in your own way and in the multitude of your warriors. So scripture is filled with times and places that says that we should be very careful about doing what doing having our motivation be what serves ourselves because it often leads us to a path of the destruction but i want you to see the other side of the sheet of paper it's on the screen as well you have the commandment motivated or commandment oriented life and this is the life that we're supposed to live this is the life that's that's wrapped around god's word and letting god's word define who we are and how we're going to live in our lives in order to obey God's word, you must do something that you don't feel like doing, or you need to stop doing something that you feel you enjoy doing. Because the reality is, sin can feel good. It feels good. The problem is it feels good for a time. And then you have to keep on going deeper and deeper down that sin to get the same kind of response from that. I've, I've heard this is true for people who've been on drugs. But the first time they get the drug, it gives them a high that they've never experienced before. But the next time they take that drug, they don't experience the same high they had that first time. 
So they begin to use more and more drugs, always chasing that high they had from the very first time. And sin is just the same way. You're always chasing it to get the same euphoric feeling that you had that first time. Again, you reap what you sow, and at the end you end up paying more than you really wanted to. The Bible, though, tells us to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh that you would fulfill its lust. That's in Romans 13, 14. Obedience to God must drive your, de- your decision-making processes, not your feelings. That's true for us as people, and it's true for us as a church. Feelings should follow obedience. You can obey your way into a new, new feeling, but you can never feel your way into obedience. It doesn't work. Author Eugene Peterson writes it and says this, Feelings are great liars. Feelings are important in many ways, but completely unreliable in matters of faith. The Bible wastes very little time on the way we feel. The wisdom of God tells us we can act ourselves into a new way of feeling much quicker than we can feel ourselves into a new way of acting. Your feelings should follow your obedience, never precede it. Feelings flow from our thoughts, not the other way around. We have to think properly. That's why down here it says thinking, thinking. And then we move on to there. The feelings follow the thinking. So we have to have ourselves in the right frame of mind. That's why we have to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And here's the thing too. Obedience starts out difficult. It's hard now to begin with. But the more you do it over time, it becomes easier and easier and easier to live a commandment-motivated and commandment-driven life. This happens because you are transforming your mind. We need to keep our feelings tethered to the truth in God's word. Let me say that again. We need to keep our feelings tethered to the truth in God's word. If feelings can't be trusted, then we need to go to the thing that can be trusted. And I'm going to ask you this question. Do you trust God? Do you trust God? Do you trust his word? Then we ought to live our lives with this in mind. Always going to his word. It gets easier over time. Proverbs 4, 18 says, But the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, which shines brighter and brighter until full day. The the longer you do it, the easier it is. Jesus said, My yoke is easy and my burden is light. So we need to train ourselves for godliness. We've talked about this too. Training ourselves for godliness. That word train there that's used is not read and read and read. It's exercise and exercise and exercise. Every day you got to exercise your spiritual muscles. Every day you got to work on obedience to God. Every day you got to work on living the commandment driven life. Not one motivated by your feelings but by what God's word says. And it has to be true not for us just individually, but as the body of Christ. That everything we do, everything that motivates us is found in God's word. We do what we do because God's word says that's how we should do it. Not I do what I do because I want what I want. God's word is clear. Train yourself for godliness every day, over and over, until what happens is, New habits are formed. And this is where when you look on, this, on, the, on your sheet of paper and up here too, either direction is a habit. How many of y'all, when you get up in the morning, you go and turn the coffee pot on? Anyone over, anyone over here do that? Yep, we do too. We get, as a matter of fact, most of the times, Allison, the night before gets it all prepped so that when you're groggy in the morning, all you have to do is push the button. And the coffee will come on. And you got that coffee, right? That lifeblood. 
why do you think you get up every morning and go turn the coffee pot on first thing? Because it's a habit. What other habits do you have that you do? Like first thing in the morning, what other habits do you have? Another one we have to do with to get up and let the dogs out. It's become a habit. You get in, open the crate, take them to the back door, open the door, put them out, let them go to the bathroom. It's habits, habits, habits. We are habit-driven people. And when you look at this, I want you to understand, when you're living life, and this is what most of us are doing, all of our lives, we're doing it based off our feelings. This is such a habitual thing for us that we do it second nature. We don't even think about it. It's easy. And we've been doing it for so long. It's that eight-lane highway I told you about before of bad choices and bad decisions that we often make because we're basing them off of our feelings or our idols and our sin. But over time, if you can move towards the commandment-driven life, following God's word, it's hard at first, but it gets easier over time. And you're making new habits. It's where we got to go. And and when you think about it, 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 the Bible is riddled with stories of people at the point of decision making a choice that leads them down the the wrong path. In the garden, Adam and Eve. We're tempted. Hey, look at that tree in the middle of the garden. It looks good. Eve looked at it. It's fruit. It looked good to the eyes. So she reached out and took some. She made a choice. She wanted to make choices about what is right and wrong. I want to know what is good and bad, good and evil. I don't want God to have to tell me that. Saul, right here at this point of choice, fearful of the people, He chose his feelings that led him down the wrong path. We see it over and over in stories in the Old Testament. We see it over and over in stories in the New Testament too. Of folks who make the wrong choice. Peter telling Jesus that he wasn't going to die on the cross. That'll never happen. We'll never let that happen. And what does Jesus say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. You will not prohibit the work of God. A bad choice based off his feelings. No, no, you have to be the Messiah. The Messiah, the one we've been waiting for. That Messiah. It's not in your plan to go and die. That's not our plans for you. But it was Jesus' plan to go to the cross. But let me show you here. Jesus is the perfect example for us of what it looks like to make every choice motivated by commandment-driven life, obedience to God. Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing. He often went off alone to pray and talk to the Father. He lived a life of obedience Where's Zach? I think he's in the back. Zach got up here. He he read those scriptures to us this morning. One of them talked about how he's the preeminent one, that he went and died on the cross in obedience to the Father. Do you remember when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying and it says he's 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 so stressed that he's 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 got blood coming out of his pores as he's sweating. And he's praying, Lord, if there's any other way, but not my will, but your will be done. Not my way, your way. And in this, Jesus is the perfect example of what it means to live a commandment-driven life. One that's motivated by love. Love for the Father and love for us. That's what, he, that's what he says in, in the book of John. He talks to his disciples, I've, I've loved you. And I, and I love you enough to go for you, to go prepare a place for you. I think it is no accident this morning that we have sung the songs that we sang. None, I don't think it's any accident. Whatsoever. I had no conversation with Zach and Stephen Bryant as they prepared this service for today. Not one time did we talk and discuss the songs that were going to be drawn from. 
And yet they chose the songs they did because I think it was important for us to hear them and sing them and understand them. That Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who was slain, the one who from before the foundations of the world God planned to send on our behalf, to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves, the only one who could come and live a perfectly 100% commandment-motivated, commandment-driven obedience to God life, the one that we fail at constantly so that he could go to the cross and die as the perfect lamb of God on our behalf. So that you and I, by faith, by faith, might have the forgiveness that he offers to us. Not because we deserve it. Look, we make the choice. We follow the way of sin and self. There's a consequence that follows. The wages of sin is what? Death. I don't want there to be any confusion. If you, if you are not a believer in this room and you don't understand this, I want you to get this. The Bible is very clear. Our sin is a, an affront to a holy God. And the consequence for our sin is eternal separation from God. For all of eternity, separated from him. In this place called hell. And we can do nothing to fix that problem. Nothing. And that's why God sent his son, Jesus Christ, into the world. To do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He went and died the death that we deserve. In order that we might be able to have his offer of righteousness to pay for our sins. He's done that for us. And it's no accident that we've sung these songs this morning. It's no accident. Because it's a perfect reminder to us of who God is and what he's done on our behalf through his son, Jesus Christ. We sung the lion and the lamb. We sang God of the ages. We sang, how great is our God. Have you thought about that? Like, just like thought about it? How great is our God? It's not just words we sing, but it's just the truth. He's holy and worthy. And, th and this is what we were, we were reading today in Revelation when we were studying it this morning. In Revelation chapter 4 and then in 5. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. And to, the, and to Jesus, worthy are you to take the scroll as, and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and you made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. And every earth said, To him who sits on the throne, to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And it says the four living creatures said together, Amen. And I'm going to ask you to say, would you say amen? Because it is true. How great is our God. And I want you to know, you don't have to live a life motivated by your feelings or your sin. Because Jesus Christ came and died. He not only just defeated, he not just paid the price for your sin. He defeated the power of sin over your life that you can now live the life you ought to live to God because we also have the Holy Spirit that's alive in us. Amen to that. He can do for us, through us, and in us what we can't do. But what we have to do is <laughs> obedience is better than what? Sacrifice. My obedience. I willfully choose to let the Holy Spirit work in me to help me to do what I ought to do. The hard thing now, but gets easier over time because the Holy Spirit becomes more and more enjoined to what I'm doing. We have the Holy Spirit who helps us in this. 
amen and amen to that. 